So it's an absolute pleasure to have you on the, the podcast. And um, for everybody's benefit, I just thought if you could start by giving us a, a bit about your background and sort of explaining the context um, to, to what you do. Thanks, Jake. Great, great to be here. Um, well, I suppose the very quick background, um, I, I started life not as a behavioural person at all. Um, I started as a very traditional economist um, with a little bit of philosophy thrown in for, for spice. Uh, didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up, so I became a management consultant for a while. It, sort of seemed, the <laughs> it seemed the least committal <laughs> career path I could choose. Uh, and then got to the point, I did a lot of work there in financial services, um, and you know that raised my interest in financial decision making. But it got to the point where I, was, I wanted to go back to academia and do a PhD, and I started looking for something to focus in. And my, my plan was actually to go towards philosophy and away from economics, and to study the bit of philosophy that's almost the, the link between the two, which is the philosophy of rationality. Economics assumes this, that everyone's always rational. I thought, well, that's, <clears throat> that's really fascinating. Philosophers have, have said a lot about this over the years. And as I was reading to put together my PhD proposal, I stumbled across this field of behavioral economics and, of course, the subfield below that of, of behavioral finance. And it just absolutely caught my attention from the first moment. It was this wonderful mix of deep theory but applied practice um, of, um, of, of economics, of maths, of philosophy, but also psychology, which up to that point I had not studied at all. And I just completely... Um, swung my entire uh, PhD after that in a sort of fit of complete self-indulgence, um, spent three years studying it and um, really had no plans for that to be a career because this was uh, in sort of early 2000s. The field was still relatively unknown out of ac outside academia. In fact, even inside academia, it was very much considered to be the lunatic fringe of the economics faculty at that time. And um, so I... Yeah, I was very lucky because I started my PhD and I think 18 months later, Daniel Kahneman won the Nobel Prize for economics, which was a neat trick given that he wasn't an economist. Uh, and this whole field of behavioral economics just really shot into prominence. Um, so I, I finished my PhD, I spent a bit of time, one foot in academia, one foot in consultancy. And then in 2006, um, I joined Barclays to set up what was the world's first dedicated team of behavioral finance specialists inside a bank. And I led that team plus the quant team for Barclays Wealth um, globally for 10 years. I now run a small uh, fintech. Uh, we are a spin out of Oxford University, Oxford Risk, and we build software to help people make better financial decisions. So again, a combination of data analytics, behavioral science, um, digital technology, quantitative finance, all coming together to really try to guide people more comfortably through the decisions that they make. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that, that sounds fantastic. And I think, yeah, finance is such an interesting topic, not just investing, but also personal finance. And I know we spoke briefly before about your, your passion for sort of educating people. And I think with investing, it's particularly hard because it can seem like a very sort of mysterious art to sort of get into but um actually it's probably uh, easier in some ways than, than people realize um but there's this lovely quote that i came across doing research from um benjamin graham who i think was warren buffett's mentor and he, he once said that the investor's chief problem and even his worst enemy is likely to be himself um yeah. would you say that's that's a fair statement based on your your understanding yeah absolutely um and and i think there's there's two important things there um, you mentioned the complexity, you know, investing is full of numbers and jargon and complexity, and it really makes people very daunted about having a go. So one of the ways in which investors' worst enemy is themselves is they, are, they think they have to get it perfectly right in order to start at all. And that is completely wrong, because um, you, you can get started in a very simple way without having to know very much. Uh, as long as you keep it really simple. But people find that emotionally uncomfortable to do. So they sit on the sidelines with their, you know, their hard-earned hard cash, earning nothing in a savings account. In fact, mm -hmm. you know, now, particularly with inflation ticking up, earning negative right, <laughs> real amounts, right. yeah. sitting in savings account, and being too uh, emotionally um, scared to invest right. that money. Yeah. 
Right. Then the other one, which is, is probably more what Benjamin Graham was after, is once you are an investor, once you've put money into the account, honestly, for most people, the rules of investing are extremely simple. Figure out what money you need to keep aside as a safety buffer, mm -hmm. put the rest to work, diversify and leave it alone. Now, those things are not complex rules, but it is really very difficult, again, emotionally difficult for investors to follow them, particularly the leave it alone one, which is really what Benjamin Graham was, was referring to. Because when we see markets go up and down and we read the newspapers about, you know, this stock and Apple does this and Tesla does this and mm -hmm. we constantly think we need to be doing something. Right. And honestly, doing something is just most of the time complete gambling. And you're gambling against millions of other people who are also, you know, gambling, many of whom are doing it professionally and are equipped with far more data, far more information, um, mm -hmm. far more expertise than you are. So for most investors, really, if you buy a diversified portfolio and leave it alone, that's, the bit, that's what you should do. And yet, and yet we don't. We, we really constantly think this is action bias. I need to be doing something. Right, right. Yeah, we're, we're prone to taking action when we don't need to. And in the case of investing long term, it's possibly the worst thing to be um, yeah. action, action bias. Um, just going back to you. Sorry, sorry go ahead. Just, just one, one point there, because one thing that is interesting, the, 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 thing, the reason why people are, are daunted sitting on the side is often we're told that um, investing is a casino. Mm -hmm. And in the short term, that is true. I mean, it's a casino in the sense that none of us can really predict what's going to go up or down when. Right. But in the long term, it is a casino, but the other way around. So the reason people are, feared of, are afraid of casinos, quite reasonably, mm -hmm. is the odds are in the house's favor. Right. So if you create a casino again and again and again, you are going to lose over time. Now, yeah. this is, this, the difference between short and long term is very important then um, in, in, in both casinos and in investing. But investing, the important thing is by investing, you are the house. Um, mm -hmm. Over long periods of time, if you stay invested in a diversified portfolio, you're playing with the casino, not against it. And right. so actually the risky thing to do is leaving your money doing nothing in a, in a, in a bank account. Mm -hmm. And yet people are averse to it because they think, oh, investing is a casino. It is, but it's a casino where you're in, where you're the house. Right. No, no, I mean, that's so true. And I guess when we talk about long term, we're talking, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 yeah. years and longer. Um, but the temptation, especially news, obviously, if there's a story, if there's a narrative that sounds interesting or exciting or even makes us feel fearful, we might take action that, you know, we shouldn't. Um, <clears throat> And yeah. I think we've, we, we saw a lot of that kind of during the pandemic, you know, there was a lot of, um, they talked about these sort of meme stocks, which, which I, you know, you, you probably um, know all about and, and why, why do people get sucked into those, those stories, do you think? Um, oh, well, well, many reasons. Um, one, so in all financial decisions, the, mm -hmm. the, 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 the broad problem is that there is a gap between the sensible thing to do or the right thing to do and the thing that feels emotionally comfortable to do in the moment. So, so we all deviate from good behavior in the pursuit of short-term emotional comfort. Now, one of the things that gives us emotional comfort of taking on a risky investment is familiarity. So meme stocks, by the very fact that they are memes and the names are everywhere, they become very familiar to people and therefore they start to seem emotionally comfortable to people and so people chase it. In recent times, particularly you know, in, 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 in the pandemic, there was another element to this that I think was really important. I mean, what, there are many other elements. One is a lot of people had a lot of time on their hands during the pandemic. And right. indeed, many people had cash balances that were going up because they weren't traveling, they weren't going out, etc. And, and so they were saving money. So there was more right. money, more time, uh, these familiar stocks. But I think also the other thing that makes people really, really comfortable doing things is knowing that lots of other people are doing that thing. So the social angle to those meme stocks became really, really important. And it gave people rationales for getting into them that often wasn't even a financial one anymore. It was, you know, it was that we're, we're, by buying this, we're, we're sticking it to the, you know, to, to those in charge. So there was, a, there was a social angle, there's a whole social media influencer angle around that. All of these are things that gave people um, just that one more reason 
to mm. get involved in this. And there were reasons that had very little to do with what economists would tell you is a right, you know, is a, is a, is a rational way of choosing a stock, which is think about the long-term risk return trade-off. This was right. a, a social pressure, an emotional pressure, a familiarity, all of these things come together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that make, makes a lot of sense. And in the, in the little uh, reading I have done about investing and, and uh, I read this fantastic book, I'm sure you've, you've come across it by a guy called William Green. Um, I think it came out last year or something and richer, wiser, happier, I think the title of the book was, but it was, he'd interviewed some of the world's most famous and successful investors on, you know, how their approach to investing and sort of what came through was that they all seem to have a quite a common, um, personality type. They're very, full of very rational, very, um, seem to be able to very good at keeping their emotions in check and they have a sort of plan that they've created in advance and I guess that's sort of to stop them from reacting to, to news or whatever it is um, in the moment. Completely so that even if you're not that sort of person if you can devolve your decision making to a plan or a structure or a set of rules that you've set up that means you, you can be the calm, collected person because you've effectively taken a large part of your emotional responses out of, mm -hmm. out of the system. Um, I, I do exactly the same. I have a, I call it my investing, uh, my investing constitution. I have a set of rules <laughs> that governs what I'm allowed to do and not allowed to do. Um, yeah. And I'll, I'll just give you one example. I, for example, in my own investing, never ever allow myself to make any decisions during the week. Because during the week, I simply don't have the time or the context. It's not my job to follow the markets day to day. I don't have the time or the context to come at a reasoned, thoughtful decision. Mm -hmm. And yet, if I allowed myself to do that, I guarantee you I would be tempted to. Because I would see mm -hmm. something coming in in the, you know, the financial media or whatever. And I just came to the conclusion years ago that, on balance, I, you know, occasionally I might miss out on some great opportunity. But I've also written a rule that, you know, I don't chase single opportunities like that either. So on balance, if I only make investing decisions on the weekend, I can do so while the markets are closed, when I can sit down with, you know, my spreadsheet and the whole portfolio in front of me, I can see where the gaps are, I can spend time on it. And crucially, when I, when I make a decision and I put the trade into the, you know, to the system, to the trading mm -hmm. system, it doesn't go live until Monday morning. So I've got an automatic pause point and I've got this emotional break between deciding and the decision going live, which is, you know, the, the, it, it's the equivalent of sleeping on the decision. Mm. And very seldom do I have to reverse it, but it is really important if you want to make good decisions to build pause points and friction mm. into, um, into your decision process. Mm. There's this common thought that, you know, to, to get people to do something, you need to have, make it as few clicks as possible and make it as easy as possible. Mm -hmm. That's true if you're trying to sell someone something. You, right. you, know, you, yeah. you want to get them from, from here to, to the money in your account as quickly as possible. Yeah. If you're trying yeah. to help people make better decisions, you actually need to slow them down at various points and have these pause mm -hmm. points. Yeah, I mean, it's critical, isn't it, for any big decision, not just financial, that I think they yeah. sometimes call it the... Um, you know, the pause between stimulus and response, you know, if you're able to take that beat before yeah. you make the decision to sort of reflect on what, what you've made yeah. um, as a choice is, is very, very powerful. And I just wanted to go back to your time at Barclays and yeah. sort of over that 10 years, what, what did you learn about behavioral investing in, in that period that maybe sort of surprised you from, from the initial start um, or your opinion changed? Oh, yeah, quite a lot of things, I, th I think. Um, firstly, when we got in, no one really knew what a behavioral finance team was going to do, including us. So there was a lot of experimentation over that time. And, you know, we were, we were building things, testing them. And the experimentation was, wasn't even so much on what we were delivering to clients. It was what will the organization accept from this, mm -hmm. this, this new idea? You know, dealing with a bunch of bankers who, quite traditional, like dealing with numbers, like all the jargon, and here you come, these odd psychologist people who are coming in trying to get them to make a, a behavioral overlay onto this. Mm -hmm. So simply getting internal acceptance of these ideas was quite tricky initially. Then we had the financial crisis of 08, 09. So I started the team in late 2006. We had about 18 months of, you know. Good times. <laughs> yeah, good times, the end of the good times. And then, um, and then this massive crisis. And the only reason I think we weren't the first team 
to be fired when they started cutting jobs. Because you can yeah. imagine some senior manager going, right, I need, I need to cut headcount by 20%. What do these odd people do? You know, behavioral psychologists, yeah, but, you know, first out the door, yeah. is because we had decided that what we were going to do is, is not just deliver behavioral finance into the organization by PowerPoint, but actually build tools. And we were in the middle of a rollout of a software-based financial personality assessment tool, which bought us six months of, of leeway, so they couldn't fire us immediately. And the really interesting thing, and we've seen this again in COVID, is in times of crisis and in times of emergency, um, the focus that people have on behavioral science and on emotion and psychology just goes up. So by the end of the crisis, we were in a much stronger position as a team in t inside the bank than we were um, before. I think, though, I think the main thing that I learned by the end, and I've mentioned we were rolling out this tool, and we did, we, you know, we, we built this financial personality assessment, and it was, it was great, it was quite widely used, but that, were, that was really the only tool we built. We spent a lot of the rest of the time either, if you want to change the way people do things, I think, you know, the first thing you do is you down, you sit everyone in a seminar room every six months and you download PowerPoint slides into their brains and you hope that they, that they absorb it and do things differently. Mm -hmm. um, failing that, you, you bake it into the rule book. You, get, get, you, know, you make, get good buddies with the compliance department and you say, you guys want to make this happen because it, it's good. So we did a bit of that. And thirdly, you, you actually just bake it directly into the, the technology that people are using. Mm -hmm. And we did far too much of the first two and not enough of the third one. And I genuinely think if you go into any person's job and you come mm -hmm. and you say, I've got all these new ideas that are coming from this academic field of behavioral science and they're going to really enable you to deliver a better service for your clients, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, and it's great. The trouble is, as good as those models are, you've also just made that person's life more complicated. Mm. Because what they're doing already as a financial advisor, for example, you know, I'm already looking at all these numbers of someone's balance sheet and their goals and their plans, etc. And yet I completely get that their emotional state and their personality is important. But mm. you're asking me, the advisor, or them, the client, to do all the hard work. So I think the main thing I learned from that, which we now take forward at Oxford Risk is if you want to bring the complexities of behavioral science into helping people make better decisions at scale, yep. you have to build tools that simultaneously makes people's lives easier and makes it, you know, they don't have to become a behavioral expert. You've built it into right. software and you can use it. And so that's really, you know, what we're trying to do now is behavioral finance on its own is pretty mm -hmm. useless. Mm -hmm. But when you start coupling it with data analytics, with digital and technologies delivery mechanism, um, mm -hmm. with traditional quantitative finance, you build it into IT systems, etc. then you can really start to make a difference. Right, now that, that, that makes a lot of sense. So people effectively become behavioral finance by people by, by proxy, yeah. just by default, yeah. by using the software. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And then, yeah, I mean, I think we saw so many other examples, didn't we, in the pandemic of behavioral science being applied with government messaging, you know, hand washing and stuff in the UK. So, yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting point. I'd never considered that during those times of crisis, the interest in behavioral science sort of go, goes up um, rather than, yeah. than goes down. Um, and I just wanted to ask you another question um, on this topic of financial literacy, because I know it's something you're, you're interested in. And what, why do you think, um, you know, financial, financial literacy is still so poorly taught in, in school uh, in the main um, that's an interesting question. I, I think it's difficult to do, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if, if you're like I am, but, you know, I did, let's say I did biology at school. Right. And I sat through all these lessons. And now I've got a few bio, biological facts and figures at my fingertips. But most of what I learned at school in terms of actual content is, mm -hmm. you know, is long forgotten. Right, mm -hmm. the stuff that isn't forgotten are the techniques that you learn. So rudiments of you know mathematics, all, all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And the problem with a lot of financial literacy is it's trying to equip people with knowledge for decisions that they aren't actually at the point in their lives that they're making those decisions at the moment. Mm -hmm. now, I can teach people about mortgages till I'm blue in the face, but this person probably isn't going to take out a mortgage 
until they're 15 years in the future. So, you know, it's just, it's just wasted. It's time wasted. And there's a lot of evidence looking at the efficacy of financial education. You, know, you design the education. Of course, there are better or worse ways of designing it. But the evidence suggests that if, if you build financial education, you sit people in a seminar room and you measure their knowledge going in and you measure their knowledge going out. And we can demonstrate that people do, in fact, learn things in the course of this seminar. Mm -hmm. But measure whether six months later they have changed their behavior in any way. And the answer is invariably no. So financial education mostly is an extremely expensive way of achieving almost nothing. Mm -hmm. And here again, for me, the real answer is, is, is technology. So what we could think of as just-in-time education, where you're giving people small nuggets of education at the time at which they're making these decisions. So it's relevant to what they're doing. There's no 15 year gap between the information coming in and what I need to do. Right. Um, it's delivered digitally in, in small nuggets and that can be extremely powerful because you're enhancing the learning by doing things. And I think in financial education, we need to, at schools, the evidence would suggest there's a certain amount we can do when people are really young. Mm -hmm. But we need to think of this is about teaching them techniques, not, not mm -hmm. facts about, about finance. And mm -hmm. frankly, basic numeracy is probably more important than financial, than specifically financial numeracy. If we can get people just to be more numerate, that, that's going to help. Um, right. and, then the other th and, and then later in life, you know, just start to build online banking with more mm -hmm. information thrown in that can be personalized. You personalize what you put in front of people at that mm -hmm. point. And then you're going to have uh, a much stronger effect. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. The technology argument. I mean, uh, it makes a lot of sense now. I think I think about it, uh, especially some of the financial decisions I've had to make. If there'd been some sort of technology helping me to avoid, you know, some of the mistakes that I might have made, um, that would obviously be a huge advantage. But I guess there's also a big ethical responsibility there on, in, in terms of providers of that technology, how. I, mean, yeah. I guess how do you how do you govern that in terms of if, if people don't know their decisions are in some way being, you know, influenced? Um, yeah, and that's a really important point. You know, our our raison d'etre at, at Oxford Risk is to design things that help people make better financial decisions. Mm -hmm. But then you have to have a really clear idea of what what you mean by better. Um, right. And of course, financial services are highly regulated industry, so some of what better is is defined by the regulators, and that's actually very useful because it means that we can do certain things with a great deal of confidence. Mm -hmm. But you were talking earlier about meme stocks, etc. And you know, you think about the Robin Hood things. Right. You could use behavioral finance there just to encourage lots of people who shouldn't be doing it to catch falling knives more. Um, mm -hmm. And it's possible to use applied behavioral science to encourage people to all sorts of things, some of which are definitely not in their best interests. Mm -hmm. so I think the ethical side of it is absolutely vital and you know we have a whole series of things that we follow we want anything we do to be transparent we we do have these financial personality profiling tools but it's always upfront people always know about it we're, we're, we're transparent in how we're using it and we're very clear about what it is that we mean by better in any particular in any particular circumstance um, and you know I think that is true of most people applying behavioral finance in, in banks. I, I've mm -hmm. seen almost all of them, I've seen very clear awareness of the need for an ethical code to do it. But mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I'm guessing there are some out there who are going, actually, what's in our interest is to get this person to trade 20 times a month rather than 10 times a month. And let's get right. some behavioral scientists to nudge them in that direction. Yeah, and I mean, I'm obviously, I don't know this for sure. But I mean, I know a lot of people sort of uh, have uh, in the media sort of highlighted that Robin Hood example that you mentioned, which for the benefit of everybody else, I think it's a sort of essentially a stock trading app, but they got into a lot of trouble um, be because it's sort of incentivizing, as you say, people to trade more frequently and also very inexperienced investors to sort of speculate and use all sorts of instruments like options and things like that. Um, I mean, I, I I've never used it, the app because I think it's only US based, but um, I imagine they were using lots of behavioral science practices um, wittingly or unwittingly uh, to encourage young young people to to effectively gamble, I suppose. 
Well, I, I do know that they have a behavioural team. I confess I know absolutely nothing about what that team is doing, so I can't say anything about that. But, you know, any firm that's looking at people's interactions online is probably using behavioural science somewhere in, that, mm -hmm. in, a, in, a, in an intentional way, uh, mm -hmm. you know, to, to, yep. to look at that. Yeah, no, I, th I think that's very, very fair. And to sort of uh, align to that point, if if somebody is sort of interested in in this topic, you know, investing and in behavioral science and sort of wants to learn more about it, but they're sort of starting out their journey, um, would you recommend any sort of books or resources um, in particular as a, as a way to get started? You know, assuming your your knowledge is like mine, you've got some some understanding and you're interested in in maybe behavioral science already, but um, you know, don't have X years in uh, in banking or finance or whatever it is. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess there's a lot of material about out there around personal finance, etc. Et um, not necessarily all of it with an explicitly behavioral angle. And it is important to realize that we can talk a lot about behavioral, but some of these, some of the basic principles of of personal finance have, have little to do with behavior. It's simply understanding, you know, the mathematics of interest rates and you know and how, how how these things work. So that, you know, there's a lot there. I mean, I confess I don't I don't actually know what I would recommend as the as the one go to source for this um, mm -hmm. for starting investors. Um, there are a number that are potentially geared towards maybe higher net worth investors. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't know. Difficult question. I don't. I don't have a go-to book for that. that I'm afraid. That, that's that's okay. Um, there's there's not always an answer for that question. Um, <laughs> and and a sort of related question, sort of um, if if you sort of had to pick one one message, you know, that you were giving to people starting out in in investing, based on all of your experience and how we you know actually behave as opposed to we think we're going to behave. Um, yeah. What what would that message be? Do you think? Uh, if there's a single message, and it doesn't, you know, I could give you a, a compound message with sub components. But the single message yeah. is don't don't wait. Yeah. Right? You know, time is your favor. As as an individual investor, the big thing you've got on on your side is time. You mm -hmm. can, as a professional investor, you're forced to post results every twelve months, etc. As an individual investor, you've got years, and so just get in, do something simple, and mm -hmm. and then work work it out from there. Don't sit on the sidelines. And so the slightly more nuanced bit of that is, is what do you get into? So I, I just have these, I mentioned them earlier, you know, the four basic rules of investing. One, set aside an emergency buffer equivalent to, let's say, three months of your expenditure. So that if, if, if something goes wrong, you've, you've got a buffer, right? Your emergency fund or, or whatever you yeah. want to call it. Yeah, exactly. So don't, don't invest that. Make, you, you have to... You have to buy yourself the ticket to invest. Um, mm -hmm. you, your, your ticket to take risk comes from first making sure that there's a bit where you take no risk. Um, it's, it's all risk taking is you should only take risk if you've done the work in the preparation and, 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 and built your safety, safety margins, right? And that's true whether you're you know, skydiving or, or investing. So rule one, set something aside so that you can afford to withstand shocks to your life that might otherwise mean you're forced to sell at the bottom of a, of a bad market, right? Mm -hmm. Then you've bought yourself the time and you've bought yourself the rest of it, put it to work in a diversified portfolio. Um, mm -hmm. If you're young, make it, you know, heavily equity led, you know, take, take, take risk with, with the rest of it. Mm -hmm. um, and then if that's all you want to do at this point, leave it alone. Just, just leave it sitting there. If you want to do more, at least this thing is sitting there, and then you can start saying, "Okay, now how do I think about, you know, how should, how should I rebalance this? What can I learn about other things on the margin?" But don't don't let the best be the enemy of the good. Don't don't wait until you're an expert, in, expertly knowledgeable about investing before investing, because you're sitting outside the casino, and you know, and and as I said earlier, you if you invest, you're you're on the house's side. Yep. Yep. And then. Um... Yeah, I think I came across a study. I don't know. You can tell me if this is apocryphal or not. Uh, from Fidelity, I think it was some famous study about uh, they looked at who'd performed best in their portfolio, and it turned out supposedly that the best performers were the ones that were either forgotten about their portfolio entirely or were, or were dead. Um, so yep. I guess that goes back to our 
original point of you know action bias of your, your own worst enemy if you interfere and actually what you want to do is just get started and, and then leave it alone for as long as possible um i think yep. that's a a lovely a lovely way to end um if if anyone wants to find out more about your work and uh, and what you do or wants to follow you on on twitter is there any any places the best to seek you out yeah twitter's probably best i'm at uh, at greg b davies d-a-b on e-s um um and or you can go to our website, which is oxfordrisk.com. Um, and we have an Oxford Risk Twitter feed as well, which is more directed at, at financial advisors and, and you know, financial professionals. But there's a lot of content that we put out on there. Brilliant. And uh, yeah, it just remains for me to say thank you so much, Greg, for your time. It's been a real pleasure having you on, on the podcast today. Thank you. Thanks, Jake. Absolute pleasure.